Interrupts are one of those advanced topics that I feel like a lot of people, at least within like the ARM community, do a pretty horrible job at explaining. And I decided I'm going to give it a shot. I'll give my own horrible explanation. And a lot of the stuff in this video is going to be less specific to the RP2040 and more of just like general ARM architecture. So to understand interrupts, we have to understand how the processor works. And I've already covered this a lot, but like in short, oh, let me zoom in. In short, we essentially have just like a core processor or whatever is just this thing that has a program counter that points to an instruction of memory. It reads that instruction, it executes it, and then the counter increments, goes on to the next instruction. So the processor is essentially in its own little cycle, and that's great, but sometimes we want to break that cycle to make it do something immediately. And this is what's known as an interrupt. We're, we're literally interrupting the processor's regular execution saying, hey, do this now. And within the ARM Cortex M0 Plus architecture, interrupts are handled with the nested vector interrupt controllers. And I'm going to cover what a vector is in a second. I don't think that's a great word for it. So each core has its own NVIC. And the uh, as you can see, the NVICs receive the same interrupts. So each core is going to be receiving the same interrupts, but using the NVIC, we can control we can control how the cores handle the interrupts differently. So the NVICs are attached directly to the peripherals. So like, let's say if you want to let's say if you want to interrupt the processor when the UART receives data. So you're using the UART for input, and you want to interrupt the processor whenever. Uh, the UART send something, you do something like uh, set up Core1's NVIC to say, hey, when the UART sends an interrupt, uh, handle it. And how the cores, how the NVICs handle uh, interrupts are with these things called vectors, which again, are I don't think that's a great name, but they're essentially just like function pointers that point to a function to execute when an interrupt is received. And all these vectors are organized in what's known as the vector table. And we've actually seen the vector table already. So um, it was in the boot ROM. And I, I, I probably should have specified this when I was covering it. But uh, if we look at the boot ROM contents, the, uh, this is essentially a vector table. So within the ARM architecture, at least ARM Cortex M0+, Plus, I think there's different, there's like nuance with the other ones. But um, the first four bytes, the first vector is going to be the stack pointer, and then we have the reset handler, the nested mask interrupt handler, and then the uh, hard fall handler. So this is like if something really fucks up. And then the, the rest of it is like up to, uh, up to interpretation, but the ARM architecture specifies that there must be a minimum of 16 entries within the NVIC, or sorry, within the vector table. So these are all the interrupts that the RP2040 supports. So on top of like that base 16 vectors we have within the table, we have this additional uh, 26 interrupts and we have four for the timer. Um, we usually have one per, uh, per peripheral. So like there's one for each UART, one for uh, each SBI. Um, and in this video, I'm just going to be covering the timer interrupts since I think that's the easiest to configure. And each peripheral handles their interrupts slightly differently. Uh, essentially, you have to like, like if you're using the UART peripheral, you have to specify like, okay, send an interrupt when you receive an input or when you send data or something like that. So each peripheral handles its interrupts differently. Section 2.4 is going to cover a lot of the stuff that's just like general ARM Cortex M0 plus stuff. So um, this is where we're going to see things like the NVIC. And this is really what we care about. So uh, the NVIC registers right here, we have um, we have a lot of them, but most of them have to do with like priority. So interrupts can have different priorities. So like if two interrupts fire, but you consider one more important than the other, you can like set, set a priority level. So like, but that can get real complicated real quick. So I'm just gonna stick to like the basic stuff. But essentially we have to tell the NVIC that we either want to set the register or clear it. So we have to like say, hey, receive interrupts or don't receive interrupts. And then uh, an interrupt can have a pending state. So if like two interrupts fire, but one has a higher priority, the lower priority interrupt is going to be put in a pending state. So that means it's going to wait until 
the higher priority interrupt finishes and then it will fire. But this is really straightforward to configure. So like within the NVIC set enable register, uh, it's like, so if we want like the first interrupt, that's what we're gonna be using in this video. We're gonna be using the timer zero interrupt. So we just set the first bit uh, to enable it. But the most important register in this whole section, in my opinion, would be the VTOR register, uh, which is the vector table offset. And this point is just a pointer to our vector table. So this is usually going, it's gonna reset to the boot ROM, but when we wanna actually like configure and like set our own interrupt handlers, we're going to have to give it an address in the SRAM. And if you notice, the first eight bits are reserved. And these are just gonna be zero because the vector table has to be aligned to a 256 bit alignment. So, and that's just because that's the size of the vector table. You know, we have the base 16, so 16 in each entry is four bytes. That's going to be a 64 byte uh, thing. And then on top of that, we have 26 bytes of the interrupt request. So that's going to be like a total of like what, 230 some bytes. So it's just to keep it clean, it's, they just have it at a 256 bit alignment. And we're just gonna put this in one of the like upper SRAM banks just to keep it simple. So in the very first video in the series, I uh, talked about the bus and atomic register axis, and I didn't really talk about what atomic meant, but because this is a dual core system, uh, it's very important that we have operations that can't be interrupted. So that's just what atomic means is that like um, these three uh, these three offsets, these when we access the, that memory, that operation can't be interrupted. So kind of having that atomic privilege is very important to avoid race conditions in between the two cores. So to see this in action, we're gonna be using the timer and there's only one timer on the chip and it's just this 64 bit counter that increments once per microsecond. So it's split between two registers. There's the upper timer and the lower timer and it's driven from the reference clock, I believe on the chip. So uh, you don't have to do any configuration to make sure it's like set up to be exactly one microsecond. I think it does that all for you, but with on the timer, there are four alarms. So I mentioned that there were four interrupt requests related to the timer and that's one for each alarm. So the timer, each timer is going to have its own register. And when that register matches the lower register on the counter, it will fire. So it gives you like the math right here. Um, it can technically fire every 72 minutes on the lower register. And it gives us a nice sequence to enable an alarm. So we just enable the interrupt. So just like we have to enable an interrupt via the NVIC, on the peripheral end, we also have to enable the interrupt. So we say interrupt enable for like alarm zero. And then we'll choose what time we want it to uh, fire. So usually that just means like reading the current time and then adding how far in the future we want that to fire. And then we'll, um, yeah, right here. And then once it's fired, it will set that bit to zero. So then we have to clear the interrupt to make sure it won't fire again. That's very important. So get started, grab those addresses, you know, the NVIC set enable, NVIC clear pending, VTOR, and then you'll need the, uh, the timer address. And as with all things in life, you need to bring the timer out of reset. So uh, just grab one of those reset codes, copy, and then let's uh, call this reset timer. And that is going to be the 21st bit. So then let's uh, just shift this over 21. And that should bring our, uh, let's call this timer. Should bring our timer out of reset. To set the timer, we'll create a function. And then let's, uh, the first thing we'll need to do, if we're assuming, so let's just say it takes one argument. And that argument is the, uh, the amount of time we want to set the alarm for. Let's uh, say that's an R0, so an R1. We'll move that timer read write address. And then we will, um, we need to set that bit to enable the t alarm zero interrupt. So that's gonna be the first bit and the register is an offset of uh, 14. So just um, move into R2, one. 
and then store that an offset of 14 and then we need to um actually can set the nvix to take interrupts so we will load uh into r1 nvix first we need to clear pending and this is just uh this is just good practice so clear pending and then r so it's coincidentally the alarm zero interrupt is going to be the very first interrupt request so we don't need to set any other bits so we just need the first bit so then store that into uh r1 and then we'll need to actually set the uh set the interrupt enable it so load that enable interrupt register and then store that So now that our interrupts are enabled, we're going to need to get the current time. So load that timer read write address. We we'll want the timer AWL, which is the read register. And the timer has a, so the upper registers for the timer, this is your write registers. This is when you want to set the timer. Um, you know, because it's 64 bits, it's split between two registers. And then to read from it, um, you should use this register, which is no side effects. I think this one does. I don't know what they are, but if, to read the time, this is the safest uh, register to use. So just um, load that into R2, which will be at an offset of, um, let's see, 10. So let's uh, load that in. And now, um, so assuming that our time we want to set the alarm to is in R0, We'll just add R0 to R2 and then store that in the alarm, which will be at an offset of, so alarm zero is four. So store that four and that should set our alarm. And because we're not calling any other functions, we can just branch directly back to the link register. So now we're gonna have to set up our vector table. So load that VTOR address in and we're going to be using SRAM Bank 4 as our vector table, just because I think that just that's the simplest way the vector table can have its own bank. So just load that in uh, SRAM Bank 4, and we don't have to worry about any uh, alignment or anything. So then store that into the VTOR, and that should uh, that should give us a vector table. And now we need a function to actually call. And I think it'd be a fun idea to kind of rewrite that uh the initial blink code so let's uh let's go down here uh let's take one of these functions so instead of turning this off let's xor it so whatever is so if it's on it'll turn it off and if it's off it'll turn it on so we just call this led xor uh and then you just need it's like literally one register above the output uh enable clear so output enable sorry output set xor and it's literally just going to be one register above the output set clear so output set xor for the uh, co is in uh, offset of seven so that should basically toggle our led on and off and then for our function let's um let's go back up here and we'll call it irq func so interp request func and we'll need to push the pc onto sorry push the link register onto the stack at the end we'll pop it into the pc just as with all functions and then let's uh, let's call that led xor and now we need to actually clear our interrupt so if we don't clear the interrupt it's just going to stay in this loop because the interrupt is still firing so if so this is just very important you always want to clear your interrupt after you're done with your code so you'll want to load that uh timer atomic clear and then clear it so that is going to be uh, this register right here the raw interrupts we want to clear that so then move into r11 and then store that an offset of what was that 13 so 13 and now our interrupt should be clear and now would be a wise time to kind of set the alarm to begin with so let's um I already did the math on this but let's uh set it to one shifted over 17 which is like an eighth of a second roughly and that should um that should set our alarm and let's do the same thing for our function so 
we'll set the same exact alarm and this should configure it to like fire every eighth of a second so every eighth of a second the LED is going to toggle between on and off and the only thing left we need to do is actually put this function in our vector table so we already have this SRAM bank 4 address in R1 so in R0 let's put that uh put that address for IRQ func and then because this is a thumb function we're going to have to add uh, one to it so just set that thumb bit and now we can actually store that into our vector table so and remember that the vector tables for 16 entries are reserved for architecture specific stuff so the first IRQ is going to be at an offset of 16 and now uh, the only thing left we really need to do uh, let's just wait for an event so after we set up our vector table we uh, put that interrupt request in and then we set our alarm uh, we're just going to be in this loop and this wait for event is going to put our processor in a sleep state so this is very efficient so instead of like instead of previously we'd have that delay function that would count down from a number so like our processor was continuously running and every time it's done counting it then turn it either on or off uh, this will just put it into like a sleep state save some energy until every like eighth of a second that interrupt fires and this is just very efficient, you know. Um, and this is the great thing about interrupts is that you can free up the processor. You can do other things, you know. The processor can take a nap. It can go read a book, whatever. Uh, it doesn't have to be constantly waiting for things to happen. That's what interrupts are for. So when I upload this to my Pika, we have a blink. And I'd say that's roughly every eighth of a second. And between each toggle, uh, the processor is just chilling. Uh, we're just saving energy. And that's the beauty of interrupts.